to the Gospel Activist Podcast in association with Stepping Out Ministries, where we explore how we proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ in our modern context. Here is your host, pastor and evangelist, Kevin Henry. Hi, this is Pastor Kevin, and welcome back to the Gospel Activist Podcast. In the last episode, we started to talk about the ordinances of the church, and we dealt with, first of all, with the ordinance of baptism. And in this episode, we're going to be looking at the ordinance of the Lord's Supper. Before we get to that content, though, I want to remind you and invite you to sign up for our newsletter at the bottom of our website, where you'll be able to get a newsletter that comes out each week for when my podcasts are uploaded onto the website, also when my blog entries entered, and any other news that comes up about Stepping Out Ministries. Also, I am available to help train your church in evangelism and apologetics. If your church is in need of looking for someone to help you with that, I'm more than willing to figure out what time works for me to come to help equip your church. So if you feel that this information is helpful and, and are encouraged by it, I invite you to pass this information on to your pastor and invite him to check out our website at steppingoutministries.com listen to our podcast, and see what I can offer to you as a church to equip you with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Speaking of the gospel of Jesus Christ, one of the wonderful ordinances that God has given us, that Jesus has given us, is the institution of his supper, the Lord's Supper. Now, it doesn't matter which Christian tradition you come from. Some churches uses the term Eucharist. When I talk about the Lord's Supper, I'm referring to, to either of those. But some specific things about the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is so important for us to practice because it's a reminder of what Christ has done on the cross for us. When we take of that bread, it reminds of us is of his broken body for us. The, the amazing thing that Christ went through. We'll talk about that in the moments ahead too, of what communion symbolizes for us. As always, invite everyone as we listen to the podcast to make sure you have your Bible in hand. I'd like to encourage those that I pastor and minister to that it doesn't matter what you read or listen to, make sure you have God's Word in hand with you so you can hear what's being read, or but also check what does, what does God's Word say and what's being said. Is it in line with Scripture? There's not one perfect preacher or teacher out there in the, in the church. So it's good to make sure that you're listening to what God's Word says as someone's expounding it to see is what they're saying, is it true? Now, you don't have to necessarily ask that question every time, is what they're saying true? But have your Bible in hand. And when something doesn't sound quite right, go back to God's Word. What, what does God's Word say about that subject or that passage? But also listen intently. As they're teaching, are they using God's Word correctly? Those are both important. So always make sure you listen to what God is saying and if, you're, if the Holy Spirit is speaking to you and saying there's something not right being taught, then check the Word to make sure what is being taught is true or not. So, again, make sure you pull your Bibles and turn with me to 1 Corinthians 11, verse 17 to 33. I'm going to read this passage to you to begin with, and then there's some points to discuss throughout this passage about the ordinance of the Lord's Supper. Beginning in verse 17 again of 1 Corinthians 11 says, But in the following instructions I do not commend you, because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear there are many divisions among you, and I believe it in part. For there must be factions among you in order that those who genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you, suppo- or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and said, 
This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of profaning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined, so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that when you come together, it will not be for judgment. About the other things, I will give directions when I come. In Paul's writing here to the church in Corinth, he's beginning talking about something that took place in the church called love feasts. Often they would have like potlucks in a way to eat and fellowship together. But the problem was not everyone was cared for in that. Some people didn't have food. Others drank more wine than they should have, which goes against what God's word tells us, right? Not to be drunk. So they were not handling the Lord's Supper properly. So they were in a state of disunity. And because the Lord's table was supposed to be something of unity together, Paul's instructing them, hey, you know, eat at home, drink at home. Yes, celebrate the Lord's Supper together, but make sure you've filled yourself before. Make sure everyone's cared for so they can be in unity together, taking the Lord's Supper together. There is a trend that some in, in ceremonies like weddings will sometimes do communion in their wedding ceremony with the husband and wife. And that's not God's intention for it. Communion is to be a whole body communion together. We're to partake of the bread and the wine or juice together as a body of Christ. I've heard people te- teach some things too, like that the bread is for healing no, it does not symbolize that. And we'll get to talk about what the bread rest symbolizes in moments ahead. But we need to come to communion properly prepared. I pastored in one church where some of the leadership in the church didn't want to have communion once a month. They thought every so often, have it. His argument was that, oh, well, we don't want it to become just routine and lose its meaning. Folks, if communion is losing meaning for you, then your right heart is not right with the Lord. Every time we partake of communion, it must be a commemorating and remembering what Christ has done for us. This leads to some of the points we have here about communion and what we see in the passage we have just read. And the first point is that communion commemorates Jesus' sacrifice. It commemorates it. It's a reminder for us what Christ has done on the cross. Listen again to verse 23 through 26. For I received from the Lord what I also deliver to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often, and here's the important part that refers to commemorating Christ's sacrifice. Verse 26, For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Partaking of communion commemorates, it brings us to memory what Christ has done for us on the cross. It proclaims also the Lord's death until he comes. So communion commemorates what Christ has done for us. We must remember that, that when we take the bread, 
is a representation of Christ's body, his body broken for us. And Christ went through some horrendous things even before he was put on the cross. Those things, that bread represents what he went through. Remember, Christ was beaten to a pulp, beaten with whips, to almost to the point of death, almost. Then they took a crown of thorns and thrust it on his, on his brow. That is more than most humans can take for pain. And yet Christ, his body was broken in that way. Not only that, but then he was forced to carry his cross through the streets of Jerusalem up to the hill of Golgotha till to a point where he could no longer physically carry it. Christ's body was broken even before he was nailed to the cross. Then at the cross, having the nails driven through his hands. And, and by the way, when people talk about his hands, they're not talking actually about in here. Jews actually understood and accepted that the wrist is a part of the hand. So the nail would have been right about here when Jesus was nailed on the cross. And then also his feet nailed to the cross. That too, very painful and excruciating. Jesus' body was truly broken for us. He freely went through that for us. So the bread commemorates his body broken for us. Then his blood that was shed, as his back was beaten to a pulp and was all bloody and the blood running from his, his brow and the blood running from the nail holes in his hands and his feet, was his blood shed to wash our sins away. That cup of juice or wine, when you partake of that, represents his blood to wash your sins away. It commemorates not just the covering of our sins, but the washing of our sins away. What a wonderful thing that we partake of the communion table, to remember what Christ has done for us. Each time we partake of that communion table together, it should be meaningful and remember that what love God has for us. So we can celebrate for that around that table together. In our church plant, New Life Christian Community, we do practice that every Sunday because we see how important it is. We start the service early on in the service with that because it reminds us why we're even there at our worship gathering, which is exactly that purpose, to worship God. And we partake of communion together. We can remember Christ's sacrifice for us. And it reminds us we're there to bring honor and glory to Him because of His great love for us by dying on the cross for our sins. So first of all, communion commemorates Jesus' sacrifice. Secondly, communion proclaims the Lord's death. As we have read at the end of verse 26, that it tells us that it proclaims the message of the gospel to Jesus' returns. So every time we do it, even if there's people who aren't Christians who come and may not understand it, there may be a need to explain it. So anytime you notice that there's someone new, pastor, take the time to explain why we partake of this table together. So then they'll help understand why. There are some who have the ridiculous idea of us practicing cannibalism by doing this ceremony in our services. But that's not the point. And then there's others who who think, well, maybe we should not have part of the service and have that as a separate service so that when people who are newcomers who aren't Christians, they're not freaked out by it. You know what? I understand those arguments, but you know what? It's a part of what we practice as a Christian. They may not understand it, but it's something that we do to remember what Christ has done for us, to again commemorate his sacrifice. So when we do it, it's a proclaiming again of the gospel to all of us as brothers and sisters in Christ and to the unbeliever who comes to visit. Point number three is this, communion must be taken in a worthy manner. The last part of the passage we just read moments ago, verses 27 through 31, 32, speaks of how we're to make sure we're right before the Lord. Sometimes there's a disagreement about that. Or are we supposed to make sure that we're right before the Lord? I believe we do. Because this passage here says to examine ourselves. 
Some might say, well, we're examining ourselves to see how we are in relationship with each other in the body of Christ. And, and there, there might be some truth to that, but I think it has more to do with making sure we haven't sinned against God. If we have sinned against each other, then yes, we've sinned against God too. So then if we confess to the Lord in that time of silence, prayer between us and the Lord, then it is probably good to go to that brother or sister in Christ that we have done wrong against and, and say, you know, I have done this wrong against you. Please forgive me. So that might be a part of making sure you're right before the Lord. The main thing is, is to examine yourselves, ask the Lord, is there any way I've sinned against you? And then to confess that to the Lord. You may be in the moment of silence and thinking, I, haven't, I can't think of any way I've sinned. Then ask the Lord, Lord, is there a way I've sinned that I'm not aware of? And when God brings that sin to mind, to confess it. You know, that's one of the beautiful things about taking communion together is there's that time that we need to make sure that we examine ourselves and to confess our sins. Confession is very important in the life of the Christian and the church. It's important for us to do that. So take that time before communion. It's important for pastor, for you, to make sure you give that time for the brethren to take time to examine themselves so that they can, and the whole church together, can partake of communion together in a worthy manner. Remember, it's Christ's sacrifice that makes us worthy. It's not anything that we've done, but we recognize what Christ has done, confess our sins to Him, and He makes us worthy. We can't make ourselves worthy. Christ does. That's why we confess our sins. When we have confessed our sins, Jesus forgives our sins. And then we are in a state that is worthy to partake of His table. Again, not the thing that we have done, but totally what Christ has done for us. There's another issue. Sometimes some churches or some denominations teach that, oh, when we partake of the communion, the bread actually turns into Jesus Christ's flesh, and, and the wine or the juice actually turns into Jesus' blood. And, and I think that's actually not, not true at all. Those elements represent Christ's body and his blood. The term for that is transubstantiation, meaning that those elements turn into actually the body and blood of Jesus. There is no evidence of that whatsoever. Even with Jesus, when he first did the first Lord's Supper with his disciples, on the night before he was betrayed by Peter and on the eve before he was crucified on the cross for our sins, he even talks about and says, this bread is my body. It didn't turn into his flesh in that moment. They saw and recognized that it was bread. Then he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. That cup of juice or wine did not turn into blood. After all, God's word does talk about in the Old Testament that we were not to drink blood. And we're not to eat flesh either. It's okay to eat meat, but not flesh. So why would God say in Scripture that we're not to do those things and yet the bread actually turns into his flesh and the blood or the, the wine or juice turns into blood? There's no logical sense. It's contrary to the Scripture. When Jesus held those things and passed them to his disciples, in a way he was saying that this represents his body and this represents his blood. So remember then, when you're taking communion, it's not actually turning into the elements of Jesus' body. It represents. It's an ordinance that God has given us to practice as the church. Yes, Scripture doesn't tell us how often, but it says whenever we do it, we're to remember Christ's sacrifice on the cross for our sins. This practice of communion is very important in life for us as a Christian and the church. Because again, it brings in the forefront and forefront to remind us of what Christ has done, why we're at church to worship, and how we're to live our lives for Christ. To choose to live light, life rightly for Christ, to act in a way that is pleasing to Him, but thankfulness still at the communion table for Christ's sacrifice for us, that by His wounds we can be healed of our sins. What a wonderful thing that we can do to practice the ordinance of communion. What an awesome example of the gospel lived out.
and remembered as well. I want to thank you for joining us on the podcast today. In our next episode, we'll be looking at church discipline. It's one of those subjects we don't always like talking about, do we? But yet, it is so vital and important for the church. And we'll talk about why in our next episode. As we talked about ordinances in this episode and the last one, I have a discipleship guide on the church that talks about the contact I've just talked about just now in this episode and in the last one. And you can get a hold of this, the leader guide and discipleship guide from our website, steppingoutministries.com or from our Facebook page. Also, I want to thank you again for watching our podcasts. If you find that they are useful and encouraging and helpful, I invite you to invite others to take a listen to these podcasts. Or also, if you find, think that some of this content would be useful for your pastor to help the church on any given subject I talk about, or especially on evangelism and apologetics, please pass my contact information to your pastor. Also, on my About page, there is a couple of media packets about Stepping Out Ministries, about our podcasts, our blogs, but also how it could how it can come and be of help to you in your church in training your church in evangelism and apologetics. There is also brochures available on our website through that as well on our about page. I invite you to download those are free to take and to pass on to your pastor or leadership of your church. Also I want to thank you for rating our content and also giving your comments. I do appreciate that. If you have a question you'd like to have me answer on the podcast, I invite you to email me through the email address in the description below this video as well. I'd love to interact with you through there or through a comment section. Either way, I want to encourage you in your faith as you grow in Christ. And if you're not a believer, I'd like to invite you and encourage you to come to faith in Jesus Christ. I have an article on my Facebook page that deals with and asks, are you saved? It lays out the gospel message very simply for you. I encourage you to read it or contact me. I'd love to have a conversation with you about that because Jesus loves you so much. And because we love Jesus, we as Christians, we want to share the good news of Jesus Christ with you. Until next time, this is Pastor Kevin reminding you to preach the gospel to any person, anywhere, anytime, and at no matter the cost. You have been listening to the Gospel Activist Podcast in association with Stepping Out Ministries. To submit a comment or question for Pastor Kevin to answer on the podcast, visit us at www.steppingoutministries.com. Thank you for listening, and we invite you to join us for our next podcast.